Breaking news tonight from The New York Times. For the last couple of nights, we've been focusing on this remarkable and stomach-churning story about an active criminal investigation into pro-Trump Republican Congressman Matt Gates. Well, The New York Times has just significantly advanced the story. I haven't had time to digest this. I'm just reading it myself for the first time right now, but I'll tell you the lead. Justice Department investigation into Representative Matt Gates and an indicted Florida politician is focusing on their involvement with multiple women who were recruited online for sex and received cash payments, according to people close to the investigation, and text messages and payment receipts reviewed by The Times. Investigators believe the former tax collector in Seminole County, Florida, Joel Greenberg, who was indicted last year on a federal sex trafficking charge and other crimes, initially met the women through websites that connect people who go on dates in exchange for gifts, fine dining, travel and allowances. Mr. Greenberg introduced the women to Congressman Gates, who also had sex with them, according to three people with knowledge of the encounters. The Justice Department inquiry, the Times says, is also examining whether Gates had sex with a 17-year-old girl and whether she received anything of material value, according to four people familiar with the investigation. The sex trafficking count against Joel Greenberg involved the same girl. The Times has reviewed receipts from Cash App, a mobile payments app, and Apple Pay that show payments from Mr. Gates and Mr. Greenberg to one of the women and a payment from Mr. Greenberg to a second woman. The women told their friends that the payments were for sex with the two men. Again, the two men here, Greenberg, the guy from Seminole County, and the congressman. In encounters during 2019 and 2020, Mr. Gates and Mr. Greenberg instructed the women to meet at certain times and places, often hotels around Florida, and would tell them the amount of money they were willing to pay, according to the messages and interviews. One person said the men also paid in cash, sometimes withdrawn from a hotel ATM. There's also allegation of drug use. Um, there's... Uh, a clarification from the Times that is a violation of federal child sex trafficking law to provide someone under 18 with anything of value in exchange for sex, which can include meals, hotels, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. There's a 10-year mandatory minimum pres prison sentence for anybody convicted of that crime. Mr. Gates denies ever paying any woman for sex or having any underage relationships. But this story is considerably advanced by the Times tonight. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This week, the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, asked the White House for special help for Michigan. She asked the White House to help meet the surge in cases in her state with a new surge of vaccines to her state. In places where we have big surges in cases, raises this interesting question. Can we flood those zones with even more vaccines than they might otherwise get? I mean, it makes sense, right? At least in layman's terms, it makes sense in terms of trying to get around the epidemic, trying to get on the other side of it for two main reasons, right? I mean, the risks of having tons of virus floating around, having tons of copious transmission anywhere in the country, it's the same as risk that we had even before we had vaccines, right? Copious transmission means people are getting sick and people are dying. With vaccines, that may be somewhat mitigated by the fact that older people are more likely to have vaccine-induced immunity now, but still, the same patterns that we saw, rise in cases, rise in hospitalizations, rise in deaths, it still holds. It's still happening. Also, though, now, more so than before, there's the, the, the additional risk of copious transmission anywhere in the country. With all the variants that are out there now, the more transmissible, more dangerous variants that are out there, right now with all the variants circulating, copious transmission anywhere in the country means more opportunity for the virus to mutate and to potentially defeat someday, you know, vaccines and the therapies that are currently working against them. More transmission equals more reproduction of the virus equals more mutation of the virus, which means more circulation and potentially development of new virulent bad variants. So if you can surge vaccines to places that have upticks in cases, doesn't that make sense, right? Vaccinated people don't get infected, mostly, which means they help to stop the exponential spread. They also don't help the virus develop even more potentially dangerous mutations. They also don't get sick and they don't have to go to the hospital and they don't die. I mean, wherever we have, I, I mean, the vaccine rollout is going great. The vaccine rollout is exceeding expectations in considerable ways. Is it a reasonable case that Michigan is making, that places that have tons of transmission, that places that have worrying surges of transmission ought to be prioritized for additional surges in vaccines? 
Joining us now is Dr. Peter Hotez. He's co-director of the Center for Vaccine Development at Texas Children's Hospital. He's also dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Hotez, thank you so much for making time tonight. Thanks so much for having me. So I obviously am not a doctor and not an epidemiologist and not an expert in any of this. And so I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of set me straight. That's how I am. I just explained how I'm sort of feeling about this as an issue and what seems like a reasonable policy adaptation to consider. Is there some of this that I'm not understanding or have I got any of this the wrong way around? Well, Rachel, it's turned out you've learned a lot of epidemiology over the last 14 months. So that, that's a pretty good assessment, actually. You know, I think a couple of things to think about. One, the major variant overwhelmingly in the U.S. is the B117 variant, uh, originally from the United Kingdom. Yes, we have the other variants from South Africa and Brazil here in the California variant. But the one that really is accelerating right now and the one that's keeping us all up at night is the B117 variant. And that's likely accounting for the big rise in cases in Brazil, in, in Michigan, and it's also accounting for uh, a lot of hospitalizations now among younger people. So this variant is more transmissible, uh, it has higher uh, mortality uh, as well, and higher um, hospitalization rates. The issue is the B117 variant is not only in Michigan, it's across the upper Midwest, it's across New England, uh, it's across uh, New York and New Jersey, and it's here in Texas and Florida and Georgia in a big way. So the thinking is, What's happening in Michigan now is probably a harbinger of things to come uh, in the rest of the country uh, very soon. So that that's that's one big issue. And the other is a lot of states are underperforming uh, in terms of testing. So the uh, some of that variance may reflect the level of testing. For instance, in Kansas, the level of testing was recently reported to be quite low. So it might be far worse uh, than we actually realize. And and then the, there's the question of bandwidth. Um, even if we support applied more vaccine to Michigan, would they have the capacity to manage it and be able to vaccinate it? And, and it may be the case. So there may be some wiggle room in terms of supplying extra vaccine, but the bottom line is the B117 variant is just about getting everywhere now. We've got to accelerate and vaccinate the country as fast as possible. And by the way, this was all predicted and predictable. Uh, and, and I have to say the Biden administration did respond. You know, if you remember, Rachel, back uh, in January after the inauguration, they gave the 100 vaccine vaccinations in 100, uh, 100 million vaccinations in 100 days. And it looked was looking reasonable. But then we saw the rapid rise of the B117 variant and the scientific community said to the Biden administration, including myself, hold on, this isn't going to work anymore because now with the B117 variant, we have to vaccinate by the end of the spring. And they responded and they put in place a plan. So they are clearly very responsive to what, what's happening uh, in terms of the specifics for Michigan. It may make sense to supply some additional vaccine, but this is going to start going up in every state now until we can get to uh, more than half the country vaccinated. And by the way, we're going to get there pretty soon. I think in four to five weeks, we're going to be in much better shape. It's a, manage, it's a matter of how we navigate now the next four or five weeks. Look at this. This was the front page of the Cincinnati Inquirer today. Uh, to the right of the big story about baseball's opening day, uh, we get this above the fold 700 word story about a local bridge and how Biden's new infrastructure plan could fund it. Quote, state and federal officials' plans aligned this week to bring the greater Cincinnati region closer, maybe, to funding its biggest single public works project, a new bridge over the Ohio River. This is what local papers have been like across the country for the last 24 hours. Houston Chronicle today. Biden's infrastructure pitch aims at Texas. Here's the Times-Picayune in New Orleans hailing the White House, specifically mentioning the Claiborne Expressway in, in their town. Here's the Indianapolis Star. It says, yes, please, in all caps. Yes, please. Amtrak proposal with new Indianapolis routes has people talking. It's, it's kind of cool to see local papers like this, right? Excited about the prospect of big, really overdue, potentially awesome investments in their area and things that'll benefit everybody, right? New train lines, you know, tearing down blighted old infrastructure that messed up your town, building new bridges in places where you really need new bridges because the old ones are falling down. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that has tons of local support. And you can see this sort of palpable excitement around the country as people start to realize that if this infrastructure bill passes, what it might mean for their town, for their city, for their state. The plan also just has really broad support among 
voters. A couple of weeks ago, there was a Data for Progress Invest in America poll that found support for a large infrastructure plan among likely voters nationwide was almost 70 percent. That includes 50 percent of likely Republican voters. Uh, still today, the Republican leader in the Senate said that no matter what's in the bill, zero Republicans will vote for it, which means Democrats won't have to expend energy talking to Republican senators about how they want to whittle this thing down and not really do it. Democrats instead can focus on negotiating among themselves, which means, if anything, this $2 trillion package might get even bigger. It also means that this package, this bill, this plan from President Biden is popular with Democrats in Congress, with Democratic voters, with Republican voters and just not with Republicans in Congress. So Republicans in Congress represent no one on this. <laughs> but what the president is trying to do has broad-based support, including from Republicans voters who disagree with their own members of Congress on this. That seems like a pretty solid political footing on which to move forward. And here's the part of it that I think is counter, gonna seem counterintuitive to a lot of people, but is also more jet fuel on this for Biden. President Biden is proposing to pay for this investment by raising some taxes, by raising the corporate tax rate on the biggest, most profitable corporations in the country, many of which famously pay no federal taxes at all. It turns out that that only makes the bill more popular. Literally, the bill is more popular when you tell people it's going to be paid for by new corporate taxes than it is if you just don't tell them anything about how it's going to be paid for. Like, I like it. Okay. It's going to be paid for by new corporate taxes. Oh, I like it a lot. A recent Politico morning consult poll found that voters by a two to one margin support paying for the plan by raising taxes on corporations and the highest earners. This bodes well for the Democrats looking to pass this plan the way Biden wants to pass it, or potentially even a bigger version of it. But I think it'd be remiss not to notice that this also indicates a whole new politics surrounding this issue. I mean, Republicans' standard austerity governments around this issue are not even convincing their own voters anymore. So does that mean now that something new is possible that wasn't possible before we got to this point? Joining us now is Heather McGee. She's chair of the board of directors at Color of Change. She's also the author of what is probably the most influential book on the American left right now. It's called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Uh, Ms. McGee, it's a real honor to have you here. Thanks so much for making time. Happy to be with you. Let me ask you about the sort of premise um, here that I laid out, that um, the politics that we used to think applied to government action on things like infrastructure or even things like health care or any other thing that the government might do, maybe don't apply anymore. That the idea of austerity and government's inability to do anything right, uh, that those arguments don't even resonate among Republican voters anymore. Do you think that premise is right? I think the premise is largely true because Americans are sick of worrying about what part of this country is going to fall apart next. Um, we know that our infrastructure, which used to be the envy of the world, now gets a C or D grade from the American Society of Civil Engineers. We know that too many families are worried about what's coming out of their tap. This bill meets America's needs. And the only thing that Republicans have going for them in terms of a strategy is white identity politics. That's what I write about in The Sum of Us, the idea that really they've been able to pull together and maintain a majority of white voters to keep putting them back in office, even though they're delivering relatively zero on an economic agenda because of identity politics. It's, it's the idea of the drained pool, right? The way that so many towns across the country managed to drain their public swimming pools that were segregated rather than integrate them. And that's really what's been happening over the last 50 years. That's why there are so many unmet needs, because it's been hard to get a majority support to invest in America that's becoming more diverse. But I do believe that is changing now. And that's changing now. I mean, as you talk about in the book, and I think is in a way that you've argued that's really penetrated a lot of people's consciousness, is the idea that it is a multiracial coalition of American voters coming from all sorts of different backgrounds and all sorts of different ideological stripes who sort of decided with the drained pool metaphor that 
Actually, it'd be nice to have swimming pools again um, and that it would be nice to have things in common that we all benefit from. And the idea that we shouldn't have anything because it, 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 we can, shouldn't have the idea that we shouldn't have anything if we can't have it only for ourselves, only for our subgroup. It's an idea that's just curdled for an, a big enough number of Americans that even if it continues to work with some white voters, it's never going to be a majority again. That's right. I think, I mean, that's what we have to hope, right? We have to hope that this is the kind of solidarity politics that can remain. But you see what the right wing strategy is, right? The, um, the, the original COVID bill is something that, you know, the Republicans felt pretty confident that they could refuse to support, even though it had super majority support in the country. Why? Dr. Seuss, right? The threat that Democrats are canceling <laughs> things that white Americans support and love and know because they think it's racist. You know, the whole theatrics around the running to the border, the, the zero sum politics about opening schools instead of opening borders. This is what they have. This is the hand they have to play. And yet this bill will meet so many unmet needs. It needs to be bigger, right? If this is going to be our once in a generation shot, it needs to have a lot more green jobs to it. It needs to be more aggressive actually on addressing climate change because we only have so many years. But this is the chance, right? This is the chance for us to say, this was why people waited through high water to vote in November and again in January, because of things that could transform our communities. And if you can't do it with supermajority support and Democratic Party control of the House and the Senate and the White House, when are you going to be able to do it? Um, Heather McGee, chair of the board of directors at Color of Change, as I mentioned, the author of The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, uh, which is just wicked smart and super influential and it deserves it. Heather, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's great to have you here.